Hi, and welcome to another pandemic program. It is my extreme pleasure to welcome pianist Erica Nickrentz again to our concert series here. Thank Hi, you for having me. Oh my gosh, are you kidding? It's like <laughs> always a pleasure. And this program is such a romantic program. I th not only is the second piece that we're going to play for you, I think the first piece we ever played together at 12 years old, <laughs> um, but these are two of our absolute favorite composers to play together, especially Robert Schumann and Johannes Brahms. Schumann was considered like the absolute preeminent romantic composer from the romantic era. He was born in 1810, and he actually was originally going to be a lawyer, mm -hmm. but then was drawn to the piano and to composition, which is extraordinary. Um, and he, uh, he, his music just epitomizes that romantic era where you know women would take little bits of arsenic at night before they went to sleep which is a deadly poison, um, to make themselves look incredibly pale and have this pallor because it was so romantic to be dying for some unrequited love or something. And their corsets would be so tight they would have to faint, right? Constantly. Yeah. If they tried to actually take a breath, they would faint. Right. Um, so, it, and his music just epitomizes that in that it goes from one extreme to another in a second, and which is so much fun to play as a performer, and especially to play with a performer like Erica, who we have been playing together our entire lives, and so we can get inside of each other's soul and have absolute freedom while we just plumb the depths of this romantic passion. So we're gonna be playing for you his fantasy pieces, um, which uh, he wrote for any actual piano and either clarinet, clarinet horn, violin, actually, um, and cello. Um, and, but though on the, it has become really well known for the cello yeah. piano version. Definitely. I, think, I hear it more with cello than anything else. I think cello lends itself in mm -hmm. some ways to the way Schumann writes music and to the kind of sliding that he wants and this sort of these, these uh, sort of vibratos and colors that are just so longing and and full of love and tenderness. And don't you think also the male and female? Like you're able yes. to portray the female in the upper register right. and the male on the lower, because the clarinet's great, but it can't go, you know, yes. the yes. richness in the bottom is not going to be like the richness in the cello. Right, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And he he was always playing with the male. I'm glad you brought that up, because I was not, I forgot to talk about that. He was always playing with the male and female persona mm -hmm. in his music. In fact, he had a name, didn't he have? Well, he had Florestan and Eusebius. Yes. So they were, they were imaginary friends of his. <laughs> and one was the very, the poet, the tender, you know, and then the other one was a flamboyant, crazy, and, and of, I mean, Schumann yeah. had mental illness, unfortunately. See, he did, and, it, and he ended up dying quite young, 46, 46 years yeah. old. He, he threw himself into the Rhine mm -hmm. with stones in his pockets and was luckily saved and brought to a sanatorium and his beloved wife, Clara Schumann, who is probably, is um, one of the most famous classical music uh, men love triangles. Oh, definitely. Um, between Johannes Brahms, who was a protege of Robert Schumann, and Clara Schumann. Uh, Clara Schumann, was literally the first Wonder Woman. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I know. she must have been a force of nature. First of all, um, Robert eight. Schumann met Clara when she was She was eight. Eight. And he, he was, was 17. Oh, yeah, okay. And then uh, when she was 11, right, isn't that when they, she moved into the house and the Well, he, yeah, when she was 11, he moved into to her house to study with her with father. Her father. Right. She right. already was a famous child prodigy touring pian as a pianist all over Europe. Um, and but he was they, in love with her when he was 18. It's kind of. Yes, he was in love with her when <laughs> she was like nine years old. Yeah. And so the, her father, understandably, was not too happy about this. And so he eventually kicked Robert out of the house, and Robert would write Clara a letter saying, on December 26th, <laughs> it's going to be a full moon, and I will look up at the moon at exactly midnight, and you look up at the moon, and our souls were intertwined. Oh 
I mean, they finally waited until she was 21, e even though... On her birthday. Right? Yeah. yeah. Even though on, her father was still not against into it. it. Yeah. On her, her 21st <laughs> birthday, they got married. Ended up having eight kids. Yeah. All the while that Clara was touring around the I world know. as Amazing. this really famous piano soloist, yeah. raising eight kids and increasingly taking care of Robert, who was getting more and more uh, in, down in the spiral of mental illness, sadly. And you hear, this is an earlier piece, so it's, I think, one of his greatest pieces, actually, yeah. because it's just so perfectly mm -hmm. constructed. It's kind of meant to be all one piece, but it's in three movements, right. and each one has its own character, and within each movement, there are different characters, so. Yeah, and he also, it's really interesting <clears throat> because he never gives a um, classic tempo marking, like allegro, which means mm -hmm. fast. Like, and all music has those tempo markings in Italian, except for his music. The first piece that we're going to play for you, he writes "zart und ausdruck," sweet and with feeling. Yeah. Which, frankly, there's almost no music he ever wrote that is not sweet and with feeling. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the first piece of Robert Schumann's Fantasy Stucca. I love that the wind is whistling. I know. It's so romantic. It's great... like the moors or I something. I know. It's just, oh, it's so beautiful. I love it. And it's almost hard to play in that you get so wrought up in the emotion of it. You kind of feel like they're hyperven yes. hyperventilating musically. Yeah, I And like I levitating start... off the piano. I have to kind of get like, Actually, come back. Yeah, you know? <laughs> I know. Which I find often in the Romantic era yeah. composers. Um, somebody just sent me a note about a video of me playing the Chopin 
um, one of the etudes, and they said, I feel like I'm up in a cloud. I'm mm. flying in a cloud. And I was like, that's so interesting because I feel like I'm in heaven when Aww. I play that. But it is. You get. I sometimes start to shake because I, yeah. I'm so over, so so overwrought with the emotion. Imagine hearing these pieces for the first time when they were first created. Yeah. I mean, I know. People must have been swooning, right? Yes. Yeah, they were swooning. Well, <laughs> and yeah, because the women were definitely passing out. <laughs> So the second piece is what? What is the exact? Lebhaft and leicht. 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 So Lebhaft and leicht. So lively and, and light. light, which again gives you no tempo marking whatsoever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Isn't that gorgeous? Oh. So the last uh, piece of the three fantasy Stuka is marked rush und mit Fjord. So fast and with fire, which it pretty much says it all. <laughs>
So the next piece that Erica and I are going to play for you is by one of the other great romantic composers and one of the three B's that sometimes people talk about, Bach, Beethoven, and Brahms, Johannes Brahms. Um, and Johannes Brahms was born um, in 1833. He was 23 years younger than Robert Schumann, and Robert Schumann had a huge impact on Brahms's life for many reasons. Um, number one, Brahms was writing in some ways slightly more conservatively mm -hmm. than what was like really popular in the Romantic era. And he used Bach as his model a lot of the time. Right. And this piece also. And this piece you're going to hear it because he does a fugue in the last movement, mm -hmm. which is fantastic. Um, and so people in that era right then, instead of, th you know, they didn't we weren't quite recognizing the genius of his music. And Robert Schumann had a very, very influential music journal that he was the publisher and music critic for. And he heard Brahms playing his own music and just 
wrote this amazing review about how Brahms was basically the second coming. And weren't you impressed with that, that his ego was such that he, you know, wasn't jealous? He yeah. He was, you know. I know. He was, like, was he, he yeah. He supported and, him so much. Yeah. I mean, without, without Schumann, I don't think Brahms would have gotten nearly as far as quickly for Schumann. As he did, for yeah. sure. And, and, and then we might have been deprived of some of the greatest masterpieces ever written, mm -hmm. because if he wasn't getting paid for his work, he might not have been able to write some of the unbelievable late masterpieces that we he wrote. We only knew each other four years or something. Because Before he died. Schumann, yeah, right? die, Schumann died at the age of 46, mm -hmm. and so that would be uh, years, 1956, yeah. uh, 1856 and 1956. <laughs> and, um, so uh, not only did Brahms move in with Robert and Clara for a while, because he was also incredibly disorganized. And so Clara took over sort of organizing Brahms for um, just to help his career take mm -hmm. off and to get him the notice. There's a lot of speculation about Clara, Schumann, and Johannes Brahms' relationship. Um, there, you, there's a lot of letters, right? Th there's a lot of letters, and there was an incredible deep love between the two of them. And just as Robert often wrote Clara's name into mm -hmm. um, his music, it would be like this, Clara, Clara. Brahms did as well. And, um, and Brahms never actually consummated a romantic relationship, um, not that he uh, was asexual, but he just never consummated a romantic relationship. And some people wonder if it was because of his relationship with Clara. Interestingly, when Robert Schumann was sent to the asylum before he died, after he tried to kill himself by drowning, Clara was not allowed to see him because the doctors thought it excited him too much. So Brahms was the only one who was able to see him, and Clara would send her messages of love for Robert through Brahms. Imagine that. I know. It's heartbreaking. I, I mean, and and after Robert died, Brahms and Clara never saw each other again. Um, and on her deathbed, she reached, sent a letter to him, asking him to come to her bedside. And he got in a coach and galloped there, but got there too late. And he died less than a year later. Yeah. Even though she was 13 years older. Yeah. I, I feel like, I know it was cancer for Brahms, but you never, you know, you feel like part yes. of it was her being gone. gone you know, it was, so, I mean, his death maybe. this was know. one of the, like, great love triangles of classical music. And certainly when we were kids, we <laughs> liked to speculate enormously <laughs> about who loved who and blah, 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 because it was and just. this part means when they're together. Yes, this exactly. Means, yeah, I know. <laughs> We still do that, actually. And I know, we still do that, actually. But um, yeah, and so it's just, it's really nice to put Robert Schumann with Johannes Brahms because of their unbelievable, strong relationship. And also because they were at, for 10 years, writing at the exact same moment in the Romantic era, but they're so different mm -hmm. compositionally, mm -hmm. architecturally. And the way they write for the piano as well. It's interesting. I remember when we were at Juilliard, there were some pianists who didn't like Brahms because it's it's awkward to play. Right. Because he plays for an orchestra, basically, at the piano. Right. So you're like fistfuls of notes. It's not like Chopin, like tons of rhymes right. and right. lists, you know. So I love Brahms playing so, Brahms so much that I, this is so corny. He's so cute. When I was in my teens, I, I never had a middle name. And I thought, maybe I'll pick Johanna. Like for Johannes right. Brahms. I remember Erica when you Johanna, told me that. Well, I never did it I formally, know, I but know. I have it in some music written just for fun. Oh, really? At the time. Oh, yeah. that's really cute. <laughs> yeah, I remember her saying that to me, and I was thinking, okay, she's definitely more cornball than I am. <laughs> yeah. But um, it's interesting because Brahms is also known among string players as being extraordinarily awkward as well. Like, yeah, I remember like one of, yeah, yeah, and and the, like, the clarinet trio, the cello mm. part's ridiculous. Oh, right. And the sonatas are unbelievably yeah. difficult. And somebody, a famous mentor of mine, uh, once said, Brahms, he could never write a gorgeous melody without having you leap around every <laughs> other note. Um, That's so, part of the angst, right? And I like, know, and it creates that, a effort. tension. No, that yeah. effort creates a tension. Um, interestingly, Brahms wrote two masterpiece piano concertos. Oh, yeah. I mean, his symphonies are un unbelievable. And he wrote one, his violin concerto is 
arguably my favorite concerto ever written. It's mm -hmm. so unbelievable. Um, and in one of the piano concertos, which is so beautiful, it has an amazing principal cello solo. Mm -hmm. And he wrote two magnificent cello piano sonatas that are two of the strongest sonatas ever written. But he never wrote a cello concerto. I mean, if I meet him in heaven, that's the first thing I'm going to ask him. <laughs> and I say, what was wrong with you? But apparently, I, there's a, a story, which I'm not sure is true or not, but and people have said, yeah, it is true, but that he heard the Dvorak cello concerto the first time it was performed, right before he died. And he said, if I had known you could write for the cello like that, I would have written a concerto. Oh, and I'm man. like, why didn't you stick around long enough to write one? I know. What do you mean? Unbelievable. Some, uh, some cellist used to um, arrange this sonata for, uh, as a concerto with orchestra. I think the other sonata would have worked better. Or brighter. Yeah, it's brighter, yeah. higher up and Heroic. stuff. Heroic. But anyway, so it is three <clears throat> movements. Allegro non troppo, which is fast, but not too much. And Brahmsian fast movements are much slower than like Mendelssohn fast movements. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's a scherzo and minuet. And then the last movement, which is a fugue, which is like oh, you yeah. really hear the Bach influence it's really there. Wild. It's so powerful. <laughs> All right. Okay, here we here go. We go. <laughs>
Yeah. <laughs> so that is our pandemic program for you today. And uh, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. It was such a pleasure to play this repertoire for you. I really feel like you're really there, your, your audience. Right yeah, there. exactly. Yeah, so uh, please join us again. We're going to have more programs that, we're, that we will be uh, streaming soon. Uh, we're thinking about an all French program, which would be Ooh. so beautiful with the Swan and <laughs> Forêt and Debussy. Wow. Yeah, which would be super, super fun. And lots of other programs. So thank you so much for joining us and thank you for all your support. We'll see you again soon.